We are going to be in the letter to the Hebrews, towards the back of your Bibles, after all of Paul's letters, chapter 5 today, verses 11 through 14. Dallas Willard, a, uh, a wonderful man of God, scholar, Jesus follower, professor at W, or not at WSU, USC, excuse me, USC for decades, professor of philosophy. He has this important quote. It says, the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who by profession or culture are identified as Christians will really become disciples, students, apprentices, practitioners of Jesus Christ, steadily learning from him how to live the life of the kingdom of heaven into every corner of human existence. The greatest issue facing the world today basically is will followers of Jesus grow into what he's calling us to be. And then the, if, if the millions and millions and millions who say they are believers would, would do that, then a lot of the other issues would start to get better, right? It, this gets down to this idea of spiritual growth. Spiritual growth. It, it's, it's one of the key values of our local church family uh, we want to grow. Not, we're not talking about numbers of our congregation, although that'd be great if the Lord wanted to do that, but we're talking about for each and every one of us and in our relationships together, we want to grow in Christ-likeness. That is the big point. We want to grow in Christ-likeness. That means growing in knowledge, but also growing in serving others, growing in sharing our faith, sharing our, our good works, and and. That means growing is all about moving forward, right? So growing can't simply mean uh, staying where we've been, right, or staying still. It has to be moving forward, doing things or learning things we haven't done before, right? We want God to change us, is the way to say it. We want God to deepen us. We want God to challenge us and use us more and more. We want growth for us personally. Uh, personally, I, I hope you want that, right? I hope we want that. Uh, we don't, what we're going to hear in our text today, we don't want to be dull. You don't want a dull knife, and the Lord doesn't want dull Christians or lazy, not growing, too comfortable Christians, right? Unchallenged and not moving forward in knowledge, but also in love and service to others. So today's scripture is a challenge to believers. Are we growing up into the life that Jesus has prepared for us? Let's, let's pray as we come to the scripture. Lord, may the words of my mouth and uh, meditations of all of our hearts, may they be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, dear Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. You are our author and perfecter. You alone should we rightly revere. You alone should we fully fear. You alone should our lives be founded upon. God, help us to have ears to hear today. Help us to be praying for ourselves during this message that we would hear you, that we would want to hear you in this time and we would grow in hearing you in our daily life. Help us to pray for those around us, and I ask that your people would be praying for me and other preachers, that we would rightly declare your truth something worth being heard. Your truth needs to be heard, Lord. So give us ears to hear, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Stand, if you're able, for the reading of God's word for our message today, Hebrews chapter 5, starting with verse 11, in a section where the author was making sure the readers understood that Jesus is the great high priest. And then he says, 
About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles or the teachings of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> this is this scripture, like the rest of Hebrews, we need to remember, is written to Jesus' followers, right? It's who, who are, we believe, of Jewish background. They know the scriptures they were raised on, right? They know what we would call the Old Testament. They also know the good news of Jesus, right? That they, they believe that Jesus is the, the Son of God who brought salvation to, to this world and that he's introduced the kingdom of God into this world. And, and they know this good news of Jesus and they, they are seeking to follow him, right? But they are tempted. They are tempted, just like we are, to retreat from growing, from learning, from putting their faith into practice. And, and, and tempted to not grow in what God is calling them to. They are tempted to become like the world around them and become, therefore, ineffective witnesses or representatives of Jesus. So the author says about this, there's much to say, but it's hard to explain because you are dull of hearing. He wants to go deeper, maybe in talking even more about Jesus Christ, and make no mistake, he will later on in Hebrews. If you've been reading it, you know that. But he also takes this pause to say, you know, I want to say some things, even deeper things that I don't know if you're ready to hear. You have some barriers to your spiritual growth, he's telling them. There's much to learn. There's much to learn, but are you wanting to learn, right? It's hard to teach somebody if they're not wanting to learn what you're trying to teach them. It's, it's hard to explain uh, something to someone if they, you're speaking in a language that they don't know, if you want to put it that way. Like, if he's trying to, I want to tell you some more things about Christ so you can become like that in your life, but that is, that's beyond where you're at. That's not even why you follow Christ. You follow Christ with a different language, a language of maybe selfishness, you, you know. So I, I want to talk to you more about Christ, right? I want to teach you more about receiving Jesus as priest and king. Now, if we've been hearing that Jesus is the great high priest, he's the great, he's the great king, and that's really not a hard concept. A kid could get that. I could go teach that to a kid really quickly, a young kid, and say this is part of Jesus' roles. These are Jesus' jobs. I could teach that, right, as far as definitions. But to actually grow in that and to practice what it means to, to live as Jesus is king in our daily life, with challenges that come and temptations to put ourselves as king, right? Or other powers of the world as king. Or, or do I really live with him as priest? Do I really believe he's fully forgiven me? Or do I live in shame and guilt, right? And so we can teach the concept pretty simply, right? But do we actually hear the orders of the king, right? And do we follow them? Do we actually spend time with our great high priest because it says we can draw near with confidence because of his grace and we can receive from him, right? Are we growing in that? Or do we, do we not, right? Do we spend 95% of our time in the world, which we have to live our real lives, but thinking like the world and then come back on Sunday and every once in a while get a little meal to feed our souls? but we don't grow and thrive. We have what some 
some folks have what medically we'd call failure to thrive where the youngsters' bodies are not growing. Some people have that spiritually, spiritual starvation or stunted growth. And the author to the Hebrews is trying to prevent that for them. He doesn't want that, right? So, you know, and I think this is very applicable to Christianity in North America today. And we have a problem of that there are less people that are part of local believing and serving churches. There's less people on a Sunday morning worshiping Jesus than there used to be. But the, the deeper problem, as our Dallas Willard quote was saying, is how many people actually uh, want to be here <laughs> and want to be here for the right reasons, to prepare themselves to grow and serve during the week. I pray that, that that's why we're here. I pray that's why we're here, right? That we want to live and grow in, in serving Jesus in the kingdom of God seven days a week. And, and five years from now, 10 years from now, we look back and say, by the grace of God and the, the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and the truth God has revealed to me, I am a bit more like Christ than I used to be, right? We don't want to be somebody five years from now, 10 years from now that doesn't even know how to ask that question <laughs> or doesn't care. We should want to be able to represent him well. So we want to be not dull of hearing. What is dull of hearing? Um, dull of hearing. Um, you know, there's been, there's been times where with our kids, we wondered if they had actual physical hearing problems. I won't name any of them. Uh, one of, uh, but, but come to find out, we were blessed that our kids had perfect hearing. So just repeatedly saying their name, there was something else going on. Uh, at times, right? And, and not to pick on my kids, but to pick on all of us, is that's how we are. Sometimes our names are said or we're called upon by God and we don't hear, right? Now, a baby, a baby with, with good ears and a working system can, uh, can hear and starts connecting in their environment right away, right? I saw it, you know, in the delivery room with Danny. I... I, I he, that our first child, right? I spoke across the room and somehow, I don't know if you're supposed to be able to do this that yet, but he heard my voice and his eyes turned to me. He just stared. Now, I don't know if he could see that far yet. I, I'm not a doctor, right? But, but he was looking for the sound. He was connecting. We're, we're made to be able to connect, but we got to get past like babies just reacting or surviving on instinct and crying to get what we need we have to grow past that because a baby has to be trained and taught what what is good for it right but we're given warnings about dullness of hearing uh, like warnings that paul writes about second timothy he's writing to this young leader second timothy 4 3 he says for a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having uh, itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, right? We're, and that was a warning from 1900 or more than 1900 years ago. Paul saying, there will be a time when people won't want to hear the truth. They'll just want to hear what they want to hear. One of the great problems of our culture right now of all sides, of all kinds of spectrums, is people just want to get in their silos and only hear the voices that they already agree with. All right. Man, I'm glad Patrick didn't do that for Ireland. <laughs> uh, and we shouldn't do that now. That's lazy, that's sluggish, that's slothful, that's being a slacker, as we said in the 80s. Um, so dull of hearing is about being lazy. Actually, it can get translated that elsewhere. The same word elsewhere in the Bible is translated lazy or sluggish. This is not about smart and not smart. Um, dull of hearing is not about smart and not smart or you know, high IQ, low IQ or something like that. It is about lazy or engaged. Applying effort and wanting to grow or not, right? Wanting to grow. How much do you want to hear from God's word? How much do you want to hear from God? Do you want it enough that you seek it out? That you carve out 20 minutes in your morning to pray and to read or more? How much do you want it? 
How, how much do you want it enough to learn how to do it for yourself, or do you just want others to do it for you? Right? Because that only works a little bit, right? I can't, I, as a pastor, this is not the design, is that the pastor gives you all you need for the week. That is not the design of church. But that is how some people live. So, dull of hearing. Some th- sometimes we are dull of hearing because some bad things happen to us and it makes us hard to hear God. And I, I, there's grace for that when we're struggling through bad things happen, happening to us. But sometimes bad things happen in our lives because we bring them upon ourselves, right? We, we end up in a bad relationship because we had bad habits personally and we weren't investing in that relationship and we weren't, we weren't growing, right? That can happen in families. That can happen in local churches. That can definitely happen in marriages. And these are things that God cares about. God cares about relationships. He cares about relationships with parents and kids, whether they're children or adults. He cares about relationships between friendships and believers and not believers. He he wants people to grow. And in order to grow, you have to hear and learn and then obey. Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish person who built his house on the sand. And he goes on to say, and then the storms will come and that house is going to fall down. (laughs) That's a paraphrase, right? If 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 you... if you listen but you don't hear and believe and put into practice and, and put into practice the way of Jesus, and he, he had just given a, you know, multiple teachings there in those what we see as three chapters of Scripture in Matthew. If you aren't listening to my teachings and saying, how do I put this into my life? Uh, how do I pray for others? That, the Lord's Prayer is in that section. How do I forgive others? How do I love my enemies? How do I fast? That's in that section. You know, how, how do I do these things? How, what is my relationship to money? That's, that, that's one of the teachings in that section. Lord, am I hearing your teachings and putting them in practice, or am I just wanting to do things my way or the way my parents showed me, or, not, or just kind of go with the flow? There's so many scriptures. I uh, just want to run through a few and listen to the ones I, you want, I guess. Isaiah 42, 20 says, You see and recognize what is right, but refuse to act on it. You hear with your ears, but don't really listen. Isaiah 30, 10, an interesting situation back in Isaiah's time with people wanted to kind of be part of religion, but they didn't necessarily want the truth. Isaiah 30, 10 says, they, see, they say to the seers, stop seeing visions. And to the prophets, do not prophesy to us the truth. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. We laugh. We laugh. But I've been told before, hey, back off preaching about sin. I've been told before, do we really need to hear the, the gospel? Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, Jeremiah 5, 21, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Ezekiel 12, 2, son of man, you are living among a rebellious people. They have eyes to see but do not see and ears to hear but do not hear, for they are rebellious people. Folks, this is what I'm trying to just do here is say, this is an old problem. (laughs) Lots of Old Testament scriptures here about this about our difficulty to really tune in and listen to God. Maybe today in our brief silent prayer, that was probably hard for some of you. I'm not picking on anybody now. But the reason we're doing it is because we need to train in that, right? We need to train in just being silent before God and listening to God. Yeah, we need to train and learn how to talk with God. But if we find ourselves unable to be silent before God and thinking about other things, healthy or unhealthy things, we need to say, okay, that is an area where I need to grow, right? James 1, in the New Testament says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. 
do what it says. <laughs> and James elsewhere then says, oh, you say you have faith, that's great. Show me your, your faith by how you put it into practice. Because if it goes one ear in here and out the other, but it doesn't get into your hands and into your heart and you aren't actually trying to live it out, then what has it done, right? But there's good news. As we listen, we grow. Proverbs 19, 20. Listen to advice and accept instruction, instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. You and I can gain God's wisdom. It's a wonderful thing. And James also says we can pray for wisdom and God wants to give that. Proverbs 1, 5 says a wise person will hear and increase in learning. A person un of understanding will acquire wise counsel. Right? Do we want to add wise counsel to our, our lives from the scriptures but from other people too, people who are down the road a bit further in life or have gone through things that we haven't gone through? Do we seek out that counsel and do we listen? even if their experiences are different than ours. Okay. The cares of this world, the things of this life can be really hard and really pressing. And sometimes we allow the things of this world to get really big in our heart. And that's, that's okay. I think God wants us to care about people, obviously. He wants us to care about the world that we're in. But if, if we allow the, the struggles and trials, whether it's in our family or in our nation or in our community, to become so loud that we aren't, we aren't learning and listening and seeking God and how can I actually help and grow in this, we will just become critics and complainers, right? And we will add to the issues, not help bring Christ's truth and love to them. Right? So that, that's it, how it happens accidentally, but one way it happens purposefully, but people don't want to think of it as purposeful, is purposely just being a proud person. Purposely just being a proud person. And your pride, uh, your pride grows. So just uh, pride means you're, you're purposely, whether you admit it or not, you're saying, I think I've learned enough. <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, the, the audience here for this letter, we, well, we, we've got the basics. Do we really need to grow? Right? And and then if you don't, pretty soon, what this author is saying, you'll even forget the basics. Pride creeps, and pride makes you a creep, okay? Pride creeps up on you, and it makes you creepy, I think, a creepy Christian. We, we should be, by the Spirit's leadership, we should be becoming more and more like Christ, literally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, we should start to smell like him in a way, the Bible says. We should take on his, his aroma of living. Not that we're ever gonna do it perfectly, not saying that, but this is the goal. This is the goal, to grow in Christ's likeness in our individual lives and in our relationships and definitely as our witness as a local church. Where a community member might say, I don't think I agree with what they believe up there, but boy, that's a group of people that really loves this community and does some amazing things. And boy, it's interesting that non-believers, they, this is the test they have. They, say, they, they think this, right? And they should. Well, you say you believe in Jesus. I've read enough about Jesus to know you don't look much like him. Right? And not that we're going to be perfect. We all, we're going to struggle with hypocrisy and challenge, but we've got to have honesty, humility, and intentionality to fight against pride and to grow, to seek growth. And that means prioritizing God and God's stuff and not being so proud to think that you, you, that, that you don't need it. You need it, right? All the profound Christians I've known that get, especially as they, as they get into their elderly state, whether it's 80 or, or in their 90s, they want to keep learning and growing, right? So don't let pride creep up on you. What are the consequences of being dull of hearing? It says you ought to be teachers. You ought to be teachers, but you can't, basically. You're not ready. Um, you, you, you bought into some other... Uh, scenario of life and think life is about 
other things, and so you haven't grown in being able to be a basic teacher of your faith. You've allowed a, a, uh, you've allowed a lack of sensitivity to God to grow in your heart, right? And God will allow that. God in the scriptures not only allows people to not hear him, he doesn't force people to hear him. Uh, some people thought it was l- thunder, right? Some people didn't care to discern what they were hearing in, in our scripture. It, God will allow you to not hear, and God will eventually say, if this is what you want, then your heart can harden. Go ahead and use your life to not grow or to grow in self practices, right? God wants people to hear his truth and put it into practice. But sometimes, according to the scriptures, God will keep people from hearing. He doesn't want people um, who hear and won't put it into practice or hear and put it into false practice or they do it for pride. In the old prophets of the Old Testament, there were people who were, they They read the scriptures and they heard of the sacrifices, but they weren't practicing God's way of goodness and justice and love and mercy. And so the the sacrifices and the religious festivals were annoying to God because their hearts weren't really in it. That's a scary thing to think about. Hopefully our church worship services are pleasing to God because hopefully the room is full of people whose hearts are longing to praise him and aren't just, you know, here for self or social, right? But I, I will say, I'll just call it out, and I think there is an American dullness of hearing. Uh, I really do. There's an American dullness of hearing. Let's consider what we have. Americans have more printed and electronic Bibles than have ever existed, Okay? We have access to YouTube preachers. I just listened to a Jonathan Edwards sermon that was preached 250 years ago, or more, actually. And you can listen to the best, you can go home today and listen to the best preachers in America. The problem is not lack of content, right? It's not lack of heritage or foundation, right? What is the problem if we do have an American dullness of hearing? I, I, you know, one way I see it is if, if, if preaching or Bible reading gets too tough, um, or calls a person to change, tells a person you've got <laughs> you've to reconcile with this person or you've got you've to uh, see your finances as from God and learn how to live with discipline there. Oh, wait a second, that's getting too personal, right? If preaching or Bible reading gets too tough, um, disagrees, for example, with a person's politics or worldview. And the deal with having so much content available is then you can just move on to another interpretation or in American history, you can just create another denomination or religion. Just, just a brief bit on history. It is no coincidence that along with the Western expansion, the so-called manifest destiny that was happening in the 1800s, right, in America, you know what we also saw in that time? In America, we saw a giant new increase in what we could, in religious scholarship, we would call cults or new religions. The founder of Jehovah's Witness didn't like the concept of the Trinity. Okay, just made a new religion. Joseph Smith of LDS received a new additional revelation. And I could go on and on. But the the, the new religions are the extreme end of what is still happening. Many American Christians don't think Jesus has the right to tell them how to live, act, and think. And Jesus tells you how to live, act, and think for your own good. And sometimes we just choose not to hear it because it would require us to change, change our politics or not get involved in politics at all. We'd have to be probably a more peaceful person, probably a more kind person, probably more giving. Now, some of you are doing that way better than I am. But I think generally there's an American dullness. Does Jesus have the right to say how best we should live? 
I believe he not only has the right, he has the absolute truth we need, right? He does give us the truth we need. We, we are definitely in America, American Christianity, we are okay with Jesus being Savior. Because that brings a lot of benefit, right? Forgiveness of sins, life after death, right? But how about his teachings and the Bible's teachings on holiness, right? Caring what we do with our, our speech, our morals, good old-fashioned morality. How about his teachings on praying and not giving up in prayer and praying for your enemies? How about his teachings on generosity? How about his, his teachings on forgiveness, loving enemies, welcoming outsiders? How about his approach to not really even caring about earthly kingdoms and politics? Though he wants you to, I'm sure, pray for leaders and encourage them. How about his calls to pray, to rest, to fast, to worship, to serve, to give? He wants us to have solid food. Milk is good, right? A baby needs milk, right? A baby needs milk. God's got a great system f- through the mother for the baby to get milk, and that really helps. But a baby's got to learn uh, and be trained how to eat other food, and then eventually as they grow up, how to prepare food for themselves. Right? At first, the baby is held and fed, and but at a point... The young one has to learn to do for themselves. And if they don't do it right, they have to be corrected and and given opportunities to learn, right? But they have to move from being literally coddled and instincts and crying out for milk, literal cries, to eventual discernment of knowing what I need for life, what will help me grow. And this doesn't come easy or automatic. So some powers of discernment need to be trained, the scripture says. We need spiritual practices or real training. I know some of you are reading the book, Practicing the Way. We're going to start a class for that the week after Easter. There's copies of the book in the Fellowship Hall. But um, in this book, he talks about having a rule of life. And that goes way back to Christian uh, monastic life where men and women had a rule where they lived of things that they would do, a way they would live to follow Jesus and be a witness to Jesus in the world, a rule of life. Don't hear rules, hear a rule of life. And uh, John Mark Comer's Practicing the Way, he talks about their nine parts of their rule of life. Sabbath, solitude, prayer, fasting, scripture, community, generosity, service, witness. Read those again and think about, think about your life. This is their rule that they discerned from scripture, but Think about your life. If you were to say, what is your rule or order of life? And if you have five or nine priorities, are are some of these in there? Sabbath, resting with God. Solitude, spending time alone with God, focused on God. Prayer, talking to God, talking to God on behalf of others, talking to God about the big problems of this world. Of course, listening to God. Fasting, Jesus said, when you fast, Christians, ancient Christians, and many Christians around the world today fast one or two days a week, just as a minimum. Scripture, all of God's word is breathed out by God for us to hear and to use for growth. Community, are we, are we prioritizing living together and helping one another? Generosity, do I see all my, my material wealth as from God, even the gifts he's given me to earn the wealth, and do I want to give it back generously for his good and use it uh, well for my family and my neighbors? Service, do I explore what my gifts are and do I then use them to glorify God? Do I serve and witness? Do I know how to at least basically share the faith that I have, do I give witness to my faith? So what is your rule of life? We, that'll be something we will explore as we go through that class, but it, it takes constant practice putting, putting what we learn into life, right? We are to be apprenticing, not just learning. And I think part of the American Christian pro- problem is we did a lot of learning without much apprenticing. And I don't want an electrician who just, uh, just read a book, 
right? I want an electrician, if they're coming to my house, that they have actually learned how to do it, and it's not the first time they put their hands on the outlet, okay? We have to put this stuff into practice. We should be able then to show someone else how to do it who's new in the faith. We should be able to teach in that way. We're not all called to be pastors. That's not what this section is saying, but by constant practice, we can get to a point where we can help others with the, the applying the lessons of Jesus in their life. And we should be able to distinguish good from evil. That sounds like a simple thing, but maybe not so simple anymore. Distinguishing good for evil. Followers of Jesus are are called to deep, wise, compassionate living and to spend enough time with Jesus and his teachings to know what is actually good here. Is this good? There's a lot of things that you might think are good that aren't actually good. And wise living or, or living in this way where we grow deeper, we'll be able to examine our own motives and also examine things in the world, whether we should participate in them or not or even work against them. So we are growing how to live in this unseen, invisible kingdom called the kingdom of God. With the real realities that we have in life, in our daily life, we are trying to live for an invisible king who is the true king, Jesus, right? Learning more and more how to do his good visibly in this world. So the transformation that we're seeking or we should be seeking as Christians, comes with spirit-led discerning and practicing, right? Let's just look at two of the practices from that list briefly. Two of the practices, prayer, prayer and witness. And don't worry if you're tired of learning at this point. We're not going to go on too long. Uh, but prayer and witness. Prayer. Hopefully, if you're here, you know it's talking to God and with God. And listening to God, right? There's learning, though, how to discern God's voice in your life, whether that's audible. That's, it's not audible for most followers of Jesus, but learning how to decide God's leadership in your life through prayer. Learning how to pray with others out loud or silently, right? Learning how to pray throughout your days, as Paul says, without ceasing. Learning how to pray routine prayers. Learning prayers of saints of the past that have prayed for other believers that can bless you. Learning how to pray spontaneously. Learning how to pray uh, through journaling for some. And learning how to pray a deep type of prayer called contemplative prayer where you allow God to really transform your thoughts and recenter on him, which now science is saying <laughs> is deeply psychologically healthy, contemplative prayer. Some of those things I mentioned, some of you do all of them maybe, and some of you are like, ooh, I don't even know what some of those mean. That's okay. It's about learning and growing. Witness. Witness. There's different ways to witness, and I, I know... The uh, part of the dullness of American Christianity is because some Christians think that their faith is their own and not to be shared. It's a personal thing. We don't talk about religion, right? And that's unfortunate because we are called to be who we are, have integrity, be the same person around everybody, and find, find winsome and healthy ways to share about Jesus with whoever we're with. We are a witness to what we believe. And here's the thing. You're witnessing whether you know it or not. So if you just say, I keep my faith on the shelf, I don't, then that's what your non-believing family and friends are witnessing. So the truth is, you're a witness no matter what. Students out there, adults out there, whoever. It's just whether you choose to engage in what you say you actually believe. But you're giving witness to something every day. Just, is it what you actually believe? Or are you just uncomfortable? So you're giving your friends who say they know you are part of a church family, or they know you have faith, but then you never talk about it. It never causes you to stand up against something. Well, that's what you're witnessing to them. Couldn't be that important to them. Right? So community is part of witness. How do we, you know, the, the, the Bible teaches us they will know me by how you love one another. Right? How we treat one another in the body is a community witness. We will be known also by how we love our neighbors. 
As one author said, if your church disappeared today, would the community weep? And if the answer is no, and if the answer is they wouldn't even notice, then the church should do some weeping and repenting. I grew up in a church that had to repent. We did a community survey. We went door to door asking people what our church could do for them. But one of the deepest things we learned was about 40% of the people said, oh, I thought that church was already closed. The only time there were cars in the parking lot was Sunday morning, and guess what most people do on Sunday morning? They sleep in, go to Denny's or something. I don't know. They didn't even know it was, there was something going on there. And our church, my church, the church I grew up in, didn't know and love its neighbors, really. Community is part of witness. We need to grow in that. So uh, growing in witness is loving one another so well that it kind of flows out of it. It's actually our base. When we love each other well as believers, as brothers and sisters, then that's the security that we can do the rest of it out of. And part of that as a witnessing community is worship. We do worship to glorify God, but it's part of our, our witness. It's peculiar. Do you know another group right now that for gathering and singing songs that were written a long time ago, uh, you know, and singing to an invisible God? No, it, I mean, it's peculiar, but it's essential. It's what the ancient believers, the Jews and the Christians have, have done, right? We, we come together and we, we, we know that God has created music, right? And, and in this way that can help our heart hear the lessons that we need to hear. Right, so we come together and then we hear them and we praise God as we hear these lessons in the songs and as we, as we learn them again. Right? And we have joy, or we should, have joy and renewal from giving God glory. We should not say, well, I don't like that song. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, at some level, I, I, I know there's different styles of music. I do actually care about the language and the type of music people understand and things, but, but at some level, it, we, American worship, we need to realize it's not really about us. It's about being a community, giving witness to the goodness of God, and then God does bless us through it, yes. Okay. Charity. Charity, a part of our witness is charity, how we individually uh, and together seek to bless others in need. There's a blood drive coming up on the 19th. I'm not allowed to give blood. They don't like my blood. High school wrestling, we don't need to talk about it. But anyway, uh, you might be able to give blood. One to four, I think, at the high school on the 19th. But charity together uh, as a church, the groups we support, the folks we support, charity individually. Charity, the root word for charity is, is charis, which is literally grace. That's the word, grace. I have been freely given life. My life is to, to be a blessing to others. You'll be known by your charity or lack thereof. Morality is part of our witness. Morality, following God's teachings, not enforcing them on others. <laughs> morality is not knowing what others need to do. Jesus is very clear about that. Morality is believing and putting into practice uh, attitudes and actions and habits that you know are right and good for yourself. And when you see that something is not good in your life, you're taking the log out of your eye so that you might be able to teach someone about the things in their life. But you're first saying, I need to follow my beliefs, right? So we have to have integrity, and we have to have more morals, knowing what is good and right. And that will be a witness to others. Beliefs, or the old-fashioned word, doctrine. People don't want to learn doctrine. I'm not a doctrinal Christian. That's boring. That's your doctrine. You are a doctrinal Christian. You have lazy doctrine. I don't want to think about the Trinity being three and one and one and three. It blows my mind. It's too hard. Grow up. Right? I don't want to think about Jesus being fully God and fully man. It's too hard. Okay. Again, it's, it's mind-bending stuff, but it will deepen us when we think and ponder about God. Uh, Butch Keener, one of the great saints has gone to heaven, right? One of his favorite words was ponder. And when I, when I applied here, gosh, 20 years ago, right around this time, actually, I started the process. He just, he just gave me a brief reflection on pondering on God's word. 
And he actually is in a long line of saints who thought this way. One of the old saints said, you know, we need to chew God's teachings or chew God's word like a a cow chews its cud. You know, just over and over again, just kind of mulling it over through our day, thinking about it. God can do that through songs that you think about through the day or through scripture verses, right? Or through beliefs, through doctrines. You can ponder God being three in one, one in three, three personages, one essence. You can go learn about, and it will deepen your faith and appreciation and love for God. Or you can say, eh, that sounds kind of boring. But we give witness because we have peculiar beliefs. They're not peculiar in the sense that they're untrue. They're they're peculiar because there is no other belief like the grace of our God, the Trinity that is our God, the sacrifice that Jesus Christ did, the resurrection, the ascension, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. We need to know our basic beliefs. And then witness. We give witness to the hope of the gospel. The scriptures say we should not be ashamed. Jesus says, if you deny me amongst people, get ready. I'm going to deny you. But Jesus, it was really uncomfortable. Jesus, I don't like talking about my faith. That's fine. Turns out you don't have any. I'm not saying we're all called to be Billy Graham or evangelists, but we are called to believe that God actually made you in your life and your family on purpose. And he actually can empower you and and, and help you to, to say something to a kid on your bus or to, to, to a friend who's going through a hard time. You don't have to, it's not about you being the expert or better than, we're not even saying that, but you can be a representative of Jesus Christ through your life. That's what you're supposed to be, right? And that includes the hope of the gospel, that there is good news. Everybody likes to talk about the bad news, it seems like. But why can't we learn to talk about the good news? Christians love to talk about the weather when they get together. In Philadelphia, they love to talk about the traffic for some reason. But here in the Northwest, we like to talk about the weather. And that's great. Weather's great. But can we learn to talk about the hope of Jesus, the hope that we have? All right. Aspirational thing here at the end. Aspirational thing. I want to talk about the great untapped wealth of our local church. Remember way back at the beginning, seven hours ago when I started here, Dallas Willard said that the greatest issue is basically whether followers of Jesus who say they're followers of Jesus will actually live into it. Because if they did, what he was implying, what he went later on to talk about is if that many millions of people started doing that, holy cow, then the other things that we're so concerned about in this world would change. And the, the great untapped wealth of PFC, our greatest wealth is not in our bank account or in the buildings God has blessed us to own that are debt-free. That is amazing. You know the greatest wealth that we have? It's you. It's you. The, I've been thinking about this so much, and I'm so encouraged by it. The, the amount of experiences God has walked through with you, the lessons you've learned when, from when you were a child. Now, if you're an adult, the things he's gone through with you. This is the great wealth. And so much of American Christianity is just on the bench, right? What we're trying to do in this, this new season, or I'm trying to feel the, <laughs> follow the leadership of what I think God is doing and asking for a new season, is that he wants us simply to find everybody to find what your ministry is. Everyone who says you're a believer. I don't care, and we're saying this at Bishop Place too. And some of those people are in their high 90s. Some of those people live in a wheelchair and have a walker. I'm saying the same thing to them. There is no expiration date. If you have a a heartbeat and you're breathing, then God has you here for a reason. And you have an opportunity. Whether at Bishop Place it might be, they can't do much but bless and encourage the staff member that has to help them with their bodily functions. But But they could be a deep blessing to that staff member. And that's where they're at. So go into it full on. Or you're a grandma or a grandpa or you're, you're a neighbor, you're a friend. You, you see a kid at school that's struggling. You're not there by accident. You have, you have the wealth of God inside you. If you know his teachings, if you have his spirit, if you've experienced his love, when you share it, it's not gonna decrease in you, right? You're there for a reason and a purpose. 
So you have the daily choice to be a witness or a no witness. Right? The witness part is up to you. Like I said, you're all, always witnessing to something, but are you going to actually witness to what you believe? Are you going to actually want to grow in that? Do we want solid food to say, yeah, I need to eat stuff that really beefs me up all week. I, I, I needed a sermon on Sunday. It's great, but I got to read throughout the week because I'm starting to learn how to help people more and work through things in my life and get some things better in my family, and, and I want to be a good witness for Jesus, so I need to grow. I need to eat more because I'm going to exercise this. And if you don't, you know, if you, like with track season, we, the kids run a lot more, right? And if they eat the same amount of calories that they were eating beforehand, it doesn't work, right? When you start doing more for God, you have to take more in. Uh, that's just the way it goes, but you'll want to if you're seeking to live for him and bless him. So each one of us has to decide if the challenge in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14 is for us or for somebody else. And that's what it's been doing to me. That's, I'm not picking on you. This scripture's picking on me. Um, will I stay on milk, right, in certain areas of my life? Will, will people keep their faith just as a personal thing? You know, what we do for a baby is maybe you start adding something soft, right? You don't go straight to steak. Throw in some Cheerios this week, folks. You know? If you never fasted before, skip one meal and use that time to focus on Jesus. If you've never had a prayer list of people in your life, you've never taken the time to write that down, write down three names and see if you can do it three days this week. That's better than nothing. Put some Cheerios in your milk and see if you can actually eat them. I'm not asking you to eat a steak right away, go to seminary or something like that. I'm, t I'm just saying, let's start, you know, if you're not. Or wherever you're at, if you're already eating a bit of steak, you know, Where's the next place he's wanting to take you and grow you? Church ministry that in the end is just about making church members happy is not what God's all about, right? And that's not what I think we are all about. We don't want to be a church that's just worried about are we going to upset people or something like that. Uh, <coughs> We don't want a church full of people that just need to be placated. That's not what Jesus came and lived and died and rose for, right? What I think this author is saying is that you are the king's kids. You are followers of the great high priest. You are covered by him. You are actually in the kingdom eternal if you believe in him. You are given access to the throne of grace and therefore you should have a joyful worshiping community and you should be a part of it. You should, you should want to sing and give him praise. You should want to, to, to represent him. For you are part of his family, this deep community of trust and healing where we know we are, we are forgiven by Jesus Christ and so we can radically and generously give and be a part of a community and we don't care about what others say about us because we have integrity and we're living our beliefs and our moralities, right? We, we are living that out. We are pursuing holiness, not for what it says to other people, but because we want to glorify God, right? We, we, we are not looking down at the struggles of other people, especially those outside the faith, because we know that where would we be without Jesus? There, by the grace of God, go I, right? And we are a community that deeply trust the doctrines of our past and the teachings of scripture and the perspectives of, of the word that help us to know how to live. We are people that are being taught. He is our king. He is our security. He is our great high priest. We need to keep receiving that. So I'd ask each one of you to think about this. Do I want to commit to become more obedient to him. I don't care if you've been a Christian your whole life. Today is an opportunity to say, yeah, I want to commit to be more obedient to Jesus. Smelling, looking, acting more like Jesus this time next year than I am right now. I want to become more moral, and that's not a bad thing. I want to become more generous. I want to become more forgiving. 
I want to become more joyful in my worship. I want to become more part of the community. I want to become someone who uh, knows how to pray for others. I, what is it for you? You have great potential. This church has great potential, right? I, I mean, an amazing amount when I think about, like, the mentoring program we could do if just 20 of you decided, yeah, that's something I can do is work with a kid one-on-one. We could, we could change the trajectory of lives and families if 20 of you decided to give five hours a week. Really could happen. Yeah. Patrick, with God's help and others on his team, changed a whole nation into a peaceful land. Right? We have great potential. But we also have temptations. Stay on milk. Stay infantile in my faith, stay comfortable, let somebody else change me, right? Stuff cotton in my ears, cry when I need stuff. Or allow God to change deep in you and even maybe make a legacy through you where, where people say that person really lived well. They really gave well, they really loved. I want to be like them. And not because we're getting glory, but because we want them to see. We do all of that because of Jesus, right? Jesus, more of you, less of me. More of you, less of me. I pray that we would hear what you want us to hear and commit to, to growing in you, to eating your solid food, to actually, actually practicing, constant practice, as your word says, the life of living for you, the life of trying to live and love like Jesus. Would you train us and help us practice our faith this week? Would you deepen us, please? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.